so we're going to take a, a look at a couple of different overlockers today. One with the traditional type of threading and one with a more up-to-date threading. This one is the Success Lucy. It has it's sold as auto tensions, but in actual fact, it's probably better described as preset tensions. You have a stitch selector on the side here, so you tell it what stitch you want to do. It presets all the tensions, but you can override those if necessary. Now, because there is no sensor under the presser foot, it has no idea what thickness of thread you are using or what thickness of fabric. So it's not going to self-adjust, but you can override those basic settings using these tension sliders here. Um, it has differential feed and stitch length on the side here. It has just here is the stitch width. I always find it much easier when you've got the stitch width control actually on the outside. It's an automatic rolled hem setting. So this takes that stitch finger out of work when you want to do a rolled hem. And on the far side here, it has the pressure for that presser foot. Also comes with a rather neat little trim bin and a sleeve arm should you need it but bear in mind because you have two sets of loopers underneath traditionally we don't have sleeve arms on overlockers because you can never get one small enough for a child's cuff um, as you can see because of the makeup of an overlocker this one is fairly sizable, would take an adult's one, but mostly what you do when you're working with an overlocker is to work around the foot. This is how they do it in industry and frankly that's how I do it all the time because I find that sleeve arm is too big and I've yet to find an overlocker that has a decent sized sleeve arm on it for the, exactly that reason. So I've zoomed in as close as I can so you can see what's going on. Um, I'll try desperately hard not to get my hands in the way too much. First thing I want to say is, number one, always get a decent pair of tweezers. Make sure that they meet from tip to elbow. Because if they don't meet from there to there, you're going to have difficulty grabbing hold of the thread and pulling it, which is what I always like to do when I'm threading. I like to have my tweezers in one hand. So in that case, I'm just pulling the thread down from up here. Very important that you always have that foot up when you're threading because the tension discs open in exactly the same way as your sewing machine. When you raise the foot, the tension discs open. So I can then bring that thread through, take hold of it top and bottom, and give it a tug, and that puts it into place. However, I'm not going to thread the far right one first. I'm going to thread the third one. And the reason why I do it this way round is because the third one is the upper looper. The upper looper is this little piece, beastie, that bobs up and down here. It's at the back. The last thing you want to do when you're threading an overlocker is to get the threads of the two loopers crossed over. If that happens, you will find that it will stitch a couple of inches the thread then pulls tight and it breaks. It might break in one of the needles, it might break in the lower looper. Um, it's extremely frustrating because if you don't know that little secret, you will then go back and re-thread that broken thread again in the wrong order. And so you will instantly cross the threads over again. So I use tweezers in one hand and that means I can poke the thread into position with the other one. So this is the upper looper that I'm threading. So I'm following the green 
marks. Sorry, just dropped that there. There we go. If necessary, you can turn the balance wheel in order to get a better attempt at threading. From there we go into that little loop and then I thread the eye of the looper. And to do that, I take the thread in my tweezers, I cut at an angle, I poke the thread into the eye of the looper and that I, oh, no, missed. I might add, I forgot to put my glasses on before I started this video. So that's why I fumbled a bit then. And now the lower looper. The lower looper is traditionally more difficult to thread than the upper looper because that is the one that has to go through to the opposite end. Here it is here. This is the lower looper. So it has to be threaded at this end and at the opposite end in there. Basically, the more you pay for these machines, the easier they become to thread. Uh, this one has a built-in lower looper threader there. So I'm going to show you now, follow the, this is the red dots now, so again through that one and through that one. There's an extra one here, I can move with the balance wheel just so I've got access to it like so. And from here I'm now going to thread the eye of that looper. So once again, take the thread in my tweezers, cut it to a point, just turn it slightly so I've got the best access. And have you noticed how much easier it is if you poke your tongue out while you're doing it? There we go. Now, I haven't threaded the opposite end because on here I have a little widget there which picks up that thread and takes it through to the far end. But that is only if I've got the stitch finger out of the way, so I've pulled that forwards and then push the lever and it threads the opposite end. And now all we have to do is put that thread underneath the foot, taking care that we miss everything else en route. And now for the needles, Again, little tug top and bottom to ensure that the thread is safely in between the tension discs. And for the needles, I like to use one of these. This is a needle threader. It has a little piece of metal in the middle. If I move it over there, you might be able to see it a bit better. Um, so I put the triangle at the top, I put the thread across the prongs, aim it at the eye of the needle, let's put the light on, that might help, mightn't it? There. And then it pulls the thread through and we can pull it out the back. Second one. Incidentally, if your machine has in the tension mast, if your machine has two sets of holes in the top, use them. They're there for a purpose. I'm always finding that people only put threads through just the one eye on the top of the tension mast, and there's a second one there. It's usually there to increase the tension. So here we go, and through there, And there we have it threaded. Okay, all threads need to go under the foot. You can trim it to the length of the cover of the table and we're ready to stitch. So I've got Lucy set up for a basic four thread overlock. I've got all of the settings at the recommended level. 
So let's just see what she can do with a piece of light to medium weight fabric. Now bear in mind, as I told you earlier, this is um, preset tensions. And those preset tensions are based on a light to medium weight fabric. So that's exactly what I've got here. I've got some quilting cotton. I've got the stitch set width set at maximum. Everything else on M. And as you see, that is a pretty good overlock stitch. When you have tensions, you check the needle tension from the right side and the loop tension from the wrong side. I'm just going to quickly take out the left needle now. You'll notice I leave the thread in it. That way, if I drop the needle into the workings of the machine, I don't lose it because it's still swinging on that piece of thread. So we take that out. I tend to put mine into that same spool so I don't lose the needle. Remove the thread from the thread path because otherwise those two needle threads as they go through the same thread path it will get in it will be inclined to be dragged along underneath and now I'm going to set my stitch selector to C which is a rolled hem setting and my stitch length to one and a half and I'm going to take my stitch finger out of work so I set the slider to R for rolled hem. Pretty good rolled hem, and as you saw, I had no tensions to adjust whatsoever. You can get a whole series of um, optional extras for this machine as well, so you can take it through the gathering, the blind hem, elastic foot and so on. So really it's got a lot of potential for the price bracket. So this is Baby Lux Inspire. It is the first machine in their Jet Air range. It has many features that I find really enticing. I had the precursor to this which was called the Eclipse. I had that for over 16 years and I used it to teach on um, because it meant that I could teach all of the tensions but I could thread it incredibly quickly, I could change the threads, I could change the setups very, very quickly without having to fuss around and re-thread every time. As you can see, all of the controls are easily accessible. So we have here is the differential feed on the outside, nice and easy to use from the front. Here we have stitch length and this one is stitch width. Now both of these work in conjunction with the stitch finger which I find is a massive advantage so if I should open this up I can show you and we can just zoom in. Now the stitch width is this one up here. This adjusts the width of that blade. Okay, it doesn't move the needles, it just moves the width of the blade so it gives you a bigger bite or a lesser bite depending on whether you want a wide or a narrow seam. But what happens on the Eclipse, which is unusual, is that as soon as you adjust the stitch width, you're also moving the stitch finger as well. 
on a standard machine that doesn't have that facility, and that includes most of them, you'll find that if you try to achieve a narrow seam, although the blade might be quite a long way over to the left, the stitch finger is still fixed in its normal position. And that means however hard you try adjusting those tensions, you're not going to be able to achieve a decent narrow seam. So because this one adjusts both stitch finger and the blade at the same time, it makes a massive difference when you are trying to stitch. Now the bottom dial here is my stitch length. Now around one side it says standard and around the other side it says rolled hem. Now what that does is it automatically takes that stitch finger out of work. So let me show you if I move it to the standard setting up comes the stitch finger back into work. Turn it round to rolled hem and that stitch finger rotates out of work and that's the magic. Because it rotates Baby Lock have been able to put the blade a lot closer to the needles therefore this machine will take sharper curves than most anything else out there. The control in the middle is the one that locks the blade down. Now, oh, I should have left it open for you. When the blade is locked down, it means it doesn't cut, cut any of the fabric. But as you see, that blade has stayed up so you can use that as a guide for when you're stitching. I find that is a wonderful advantage um, because obviously it depends on what width you've got. But on this machine, if I'm quilting, I will set my stitch width dial to around the six mark, six millimeters. And I usually find that that will put my um, left needle line in exactly a quarter inch seam, um, which obviously if you're quilting that will make life a great deal easier. Now you're about to see why the baby lock machines are the, regarded as the Rolls Royce in the market, because Instead of eyes and loops and roundy roundy things underneath, uh, the looper threads on here go through tubes. So because they go through tubes, there's no danger of me crossing these threads over as I'm threading the machine. So I can thread this in any order. So we're going to start with the lower looper in order to thread. I press this button. And that pulls those two little tubes out part way. I then turn the balance wheel and they come out the full way. Tubes are now joined, the machine will not work. I slide that over to the right hand side and I poke half an inch of thread down that hole. This is attached to a set of bellows inside, so when I press it, it sends a jet of air down the tube and it comes out here like so. I can now cut that thread to about the length of that cover and it will sort itself out. I do not have to put these threads under the foot. So upper looper comes in exactly the same way through the tension mark, tension discs half an inch into the hole like so. Connect up the bellows to the upper looper tube and that one will come out here like that. Needles
Now to thread the needles, I open the tubes and I line up the two green marks on the side here. That puts the needles at the correct position for the needle threader to work. Now I have a slider on here, left and right needle. There's my needle threader. I just hold my thread up under it and it pulls the thread through terribly easily. And the right, left needle, sorry. Slide it over to the left hand side. Hold my thread under. And we're done. Trim off the excess. There's a thread cutter on the side. Leave it there. It will sort itself out without any problems whatsoever. So I'm going to set this to maximum stitch width, which is a massive seven and a half millimeters. Stitch length two and a half. Differential feed stays on N. Foot down. All my tensions are on four. I usually find with these settings, four will most likely give me a decent stitch. Is my fourth thread overlock. Now that's one side, that's the other. If I want to work out which is the looper I'm looking at, am I looking at the upper looper or am I looking at the lower looper? I can see here two needle lines. One is at the very edge of the stitching that's the right needle there. When I can see both needle lines, I am looking at the upper looper. This is the top side of the fabric as it went through the machine. If I turn it over, I can no longer see both needle lines. There's an edge, but there's no needle line in the middle. Therefore, I'm looking at the lower looper. To check the tensions, first I open it out. If those threads, sorry, if those the fabric is puckering, it means that the needle thread is too tight. And therefore I just loosen these two here. The lower the number, the looser the tension. If that is gaping, then the needle tension is too loose. Now that is a little bit on the loose side, so I'm going to tighten both of these left hand needles by one whole number. So instead of four, I'm setting that to five. That will then give me a perfect seam on that side, bearing in mind I'm working on a woven fabric. And then to check your loop attention, you turn it over. Sorry, wrong side, there we go, that's the top. If the loops are hanging off the edge of the fabric, it means my loopers are too loose, so I tighten those two. If the fabric is rolling, is puckering, it means that the loop attentions are too tight, and they are pulling that fabric over, so I would loosen those two. Let me just do a single line of stitching. If 
if I want to gather that fabric, I can undo the edge stitches, the long threads are my looper threads, the short threads are those from the needle, and if I get hold of those, I can gather this fabric far more efficiently than you can ever do with a sewing machine stitch. And that is how I do all of my e-stitching on the top of a sleeve head. Alternatively, you can use the differential feed. Now if I just open this so you can see what's happening. What I've just done there is called clearing the stitch fingers. That's taken all of the stitches off of the stitch finger, which enables me if I'm maybe working from um, on a circle and I want to put the fabric in from the side, I would do that in order to clear the stitch fingers and then any piece of fabric you could just slide in from the side without it catching. Now on an overlocker you have two sets of feed dogs. Just turn those so you might be able to see a little better. The one at the back always goes at the same speed. Using my differential feed I can adjust the speed of these front ones. When I set my differential feed to two, come back out again. If I put this to two, the front feed dogs are going twice as fast as the back ones. It does help if you put your foot back on again. So having set my differential feed to two, I can emphasize the effect by setting my stitch length to four. And this is what happens. Because of the engineering on this machine, it gives me a perfect two to one gather on a light to medium weight fabric. I'm frequently being asked how to work out where to run your fabric so that you get the seam allowance in the right place because obviously the excess in your seam allowance will be cut off. So here we have the fabric that I'm using doubled so that I get it all correct because obviously a single thickness is going to move differently to a double thickness. I have marked on the fabric five eighths of an inch from the edge and I want my needle to be exactly in that line to give me the correct five eighths inch seam. If you're just learning with a machine it's always a good idea to raise the front of the foot with your thumb because many of these machines will actually work with the foot up. Only the very top end machines um, have a safety cutout that won't work if the foot is raised. Uh, most others will. So what I do is I've got the needle positions are marked on the front of my foot here. So I'm lining up my drawn 5 8 inch line with the leftmost needle. And I'm going to just stitch that until I can see that the needle is just in, I can turn it by hand if I wish, yeah the needle is exactly in the right position. So now I take a pencil or a china graph pencil or if you don't want to mark it just use a piece of masking tape and I've just marked the edge where I want that fabric to run to so I can now get my seam in exactly 
exactly the right position for my 5 8 inch. When you run off, leave a good length of chain at the back because if you fail to do so, those two needle threads wrap around the lower looper. If you've cut that chain too short, you'll find that as the needles go up, they unthread themselves. So there we go. That's stitched right into that line that I drew earlier. These are the kinds of pins I like to use for overlocking. And I will put those in. I can't do it with this array round. I will put those pins in like so. That means I won't miss a pin because I can see those quite clearly. Most of the time I use the differential feed on my overlocker to sew in the sleeve heads. So where you have to do e-stitching at the top of your sleeve heads, I don't bother with that. I use my overlocker and my differential feed to gather the sleeve head. You see here I have joined the shoulder seam and I have the sleeve head underneath which I've pinned straight to there and then where it would start gathering I have just left it quite loose. I'm going to stitch with the sleeve head underneath I have already checked my seam allowance and in order to get the 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance to get the um, seam line in the right position here I've worked out that I need to line up the edge between the L and the R. I always do a little test run first to check that I've got my 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance in exactly the right position. So stitch length is set to 3, stitch width at maximum. I've checked and adjusted the tensions to suit the fabric. I've currently got my differential feed set to N. So we're going to stitch the first part of this seam. Bear in mind as well I have not stitched the side seams, I have only stitched the shoulder seams. That allows me to put these sleeves in flat, which is so much easier on an overlocker. Always make sure that it's clear underneath and there's no folds that are going to catch your fabric. As you see, I put my um, pins in that way with a large head so I can see exactly where they are and what's happening and this is where I'm lining up with my finger the sleeve head fabric now I'm going to click the differential feed up to 1.3 holding the sleeve head in place as we stitch. By holding onto the shoulder seam and just keeping my finger in there to hold the sleeve head in place. Take that out. It enables me to gather the underneath piece of fabric onto the top. And those feed dogs are doing all the work that your e-stitching would have done. Now I'm back down to where the gathering has flattened out. So I'm putting my differential feed back to N.
The other advantage I find of doing it this way, if it's a new pattern, once I have stitched that shoulder seam, I will then try it on. If I need then to take in that shoulder seam, because I'm quite narrow shouldered, if I need to take it in, I can do so very easily. You see you have a slight gathering here and it has eased the sleeve head onto that armhole without any major issues at all. Look at it from the right side. Yeah. Perfect. Now one of the techniques I'd like to talk to you about today is a rolled hem. Rolled hem, I feel, on an overlocker is a darn sight easier than you can ever achieve on a sewing machine because you don't have to sit and try and feed that uh, fine fabric through the foot as you do on your sewing machine. On this one, we uh, start out with removing the left needle. It's the same incidentally on all overlockers, not just this one. So I'm taking out the left needle. Once again, I haven't cut the thread um, because I can get hold of it. If I drop it um, on the baby locks, there's a little tray at the bottom that the uh, needle drops into. But most machines don't have that, so I always recommend that you leave the thread in and then you don't run the risk of dropping it into the workings of the machine. So having removed that needle, uh, I've now got just my right needle, so I leave that tension the same. I leave the tension the same on the upper looper, but on the lower looper, I'm going to increase my tension by two whole numbers. And what that effect effectively does is the lower looper thread pulls tight and pulls the fabric over into a rolled hem. You'll have to tweak it slightly with different fabrics, but usually I find about two whole numbers tighter than you have been working on uh, gives me a much better finish. Uh, Stitch length, well on this machine I'm going to take that stitch finger out of work so I just turn it round to the rolled hem setting and that has automatically removed the stitch finger. Uh, on your machine, on a lot of machines you just have a slider here so you slide it from back to front to the rolled hem setting. Uh, some older machines you have to change the needle plate and even on some you have to actually remove the stitch finger. Um, but this one is dead easy, I just turn the dial round and I'm going to now reduce my stitch width to medium which is around three and a half millimetres and that should give us a pretty good rolled hem. Now that is the upper looper that you're seeing over the edge of the fabric and on the other side if we've got our tensions right the lower looper will have completely disappeared. Now I can improve that a bit I think by tightening. I'm going to tighten the lower looper by half a number and I'm going to loosen the upper looper by one. That should give me more upper looper thread to cover that edge and it should make that lower looper thread completely disappear. Now I've got one or two little holes in that stitching so I'm going to reduce the stitch length by one dot. 
So it's taken it to about one and a quarter millimetres. Let's see if we've done any better. Always watch that tail because it has a tendency to curl and if it curls it can dive into the workings of the machine. Now that, in my critical eye, is a darn good rolled hem. When you're using something like a chiffon, you need to be aware that I now have my stitch length at one and a quarter millimetres. I'm actually using a size 90 needle. That is going to give me quite a few stab holes at the very edge of this fabric. So we'll run it through and see what happens. Change nothing. Now, as predicted, it is coming away from the edge here. That's because my stitch length is too short. This fabric is very loosely woven and I am stabbing the edge of the fabric and it's pulling all of those stitches off. So we have several possibilities. We can, let's take that all off, we can increase the stitch length. So I'm going to set that to two. That has moved the stab holes further apart. I'm also going to increase the stitch width and that puts my stab holes further from the edge of the fabric. So let's have another go, see if we've improved it. There we go. See, that's considerably better. Another thing that I will often do um, with a finer fabric, and it's particularly nice on a chiffon type fabric, is to have the stitch length, uh, the stitch width quite wide, but increase that stitch length considerably, and that then gives what they call a pico edge. That's the wrong side, that's the right side. That gives you a pico edge which is much softer. So if you've got a lightweight chiffon such as this and you want a nice soft edge because the rolled hem can be quite solid sometimes, um, then try those settings with a much longer stitch length and a wider stitch and you will often find that that will give you a much nicer softer edge for your finer fabrics. I'm going to go back to my original settings which was medium and one and a half and I'm going to show you how to achieve a lettuce edge on stretch fabric. So first off I need to find which way is the stretchiest. This is fabulous for flounces on the bottom of children's dresses and cuffs and all sorts. Now we can use the differential feed but the differential feed only goes down to 0.6 which means that the front feed dog is only going at 0.6 the speed of the back do feed dog. That gives us a reasonable amount of stretch but I have found a much better way, a much more efficient way of really getting an extreme lettuce edge. I guess this is called extreme overlocking. So as soon as the needle is in the fabric, I'm going to press down on the fabric. So that in effect is stretching that fabric considerably. And the more I stretch it, the more of a lettuce edge I get. It helps to just keep even pressure and it's much easier to do it that way than actually pulling on the fabric and trying to stretch it. 
when you take it off the machine there is your lettuce edge but you can further tweak it I have used this edge on the bottom of t-shirts as well as cuffs and it can look really really effective I'm staying with the four thread overlock and I'm going to show you how to put a zip in with the overlocker now some people have um, tried to put a zip in using the standard foot and if I line it up so that the zip is just on the very edge of the foot you're going to put, let me open that so you can see better here's my needle line here you're going to put that needle line quite a long way away from the edge of the foot if you try to put it under the foot and line it up better there's a strong possibility that because that foot is totally flat underneath it's going to push the zip out to the side and once again you'll finish up with the line of stitching too far from the edge of the zip so what I prefer to do is to use the piping foot now this is the five millimeter piping foot it very helpfully tells you on the front it says P5 and what is special about this foot is the fact that it has quite a decent size groove underneath and that is just the right size for the teeth of a standard nylon zip to slide along it like so and that will keep it completely straight while you're stitching most overlockers have got a lever on the back to change the foot so press that the foot drops off you've got extra foot lift so you can raise the foot and get that one out of the way and now we're going to put the replacement foot on press the button give it a wiggle to make sure that it's safe and because I'm a bit of a wimp I always raise it and lower it just to make sure that it's not going to come adrift um, and for my let's shut those here is my zip it helps if you that's better um, my zip is in between the bag fabric and the lining fabric and the zip is right sides to right side of the bag fabric and then with the lining on top like so so what we have to do is raise the foot and clear the stitch fingers that means just give them a tug backwards so you haven't got a knot of thread wrapped around the stitch fingers and that means that you can actually get the zip in quite easily without it causing a problem now I can feel the zip there I can see at the front of the foot where the groove lies so I've lined up the zip to go into that groove if I now put the foot down on it because of the groove underneath it's going to keep the stitching quite nice and straight I put my stitch width at maximum most zips are around seven and a half to eight millimeters wide so I find it might trim some off but I find that tends to give me a fairly successful seam my stitch length I set to about three millimeters depending on the fabric and I know this machine so I'm going to put my needle tensions at about five and that will give me a good solid seam in my zip as you see I'm using the clips I find those quite useful when you're using an overlocker 
I should have said as well, always make sure with an overlocker that your zip is longer than the fabric and that means that you can put the zip pull out of the way as I have done here you see so the zip pull is well out of the way um, <coughs> excuse me because you have two needles it's impossible to pivot the way that you would with a sewing machine so you can't go around that zip pull so once you get your needles, not your blade, to the end of the fabric, then you can raise the foot, turn that at right angles, and either hand turn it or put your foot on the pedal and drive off. So now if I open this out, Now you see how perfectly that has been stitched into the zip. It is so neat that I usually find, especially with a fine lining fabric like this, I usually find it best to press that fabric away from the zip and on my sewing machine just do a line of top stitching down here. But look how neat that is. And then of course I do exactly the same for the other side, remembering right side of the zip to the right side of the fabric and then you put your lining on the other side to make a sandwich. Once you've done that you can then cut off the excess, put the two main pieces of fabric together like so, stitch down there, stitch down the lining fabric, making sure that you leave a gap so that you can turn the whole bag inside out when you're finished and that is a very very quick and easy way of making your lined bags. As I was finishing off this bag it's just occurred to me that I do use another technique um, one which, if you're a perfectionist, you should perhaps look away now. Um, I find this is quite a, a quick fix when I'm doing these bags. I have stitched around three sides. So this is the main fabric. I've stitched all the way around there. Um, I hand turn the wheel when I get to the zip. Um, because I like to save my needles, I'm not inclined to drive over them, so I just turn the balance wheel by hand when I get to that thick bit. But I've left the entire bottom of the lining open, because I do something slightly differently on that. As I say, if you're a perfectionist, you might not like it. Just turn this the right way out. because then normally you would fold that bottom end in, press it and you would then, once you'd folded it in, either hand stitch or you would um, do a top stitch with your sewing machine. What I tend to do, and as I say this is a bit of a cheat, is to set my machine up regardless of the fact that it has um, I've still got two needles in I would set my machine up for a rolled hem so I've taken the stitch finger out of work okay so that is now out of work I'm going to reduce my width to about six and a half not as narrow as I would normally have it and I'm going to reduce the tension, oh sorry, increase the tension on my lower looper to seven. It's gone from four to seven. And this basically is what I would call a tuck and roll. So it's going to stitch the ends of the bag together. But because I'm using two needles, 
it will give me a roll hem and a seam. The two needles give me extra strength for my seam. Should have said the stitch length is around one and a half millimetres. Now, if you don't like that finish at the bottom of your bag, then you better try the traditional method. But I find that is perfectly adequate once it's inside the bag. And once this is pressed, there's my nice zip bag. Press that, and as you see, lovely and neat at the top for the zip. I shall now show you one of my favourite stitches. This is going to be the two thread flat lock. Not all overlockers will do a two thread flat lock. In order to do it, you must have one of these. Um, this is called a subsidiary looper and it sits on top of your upper looper like so. This one just slides over, slots in, it bungs up the hole so you never forget to take that off if you're going back to four thread overlock because you'll find it won't thread as it won't come up the end hole. Um, <clears throat> for a two thread flat lock you use the lower looper and either the right or the left needle. So I'm going to use the right needle so I will just take out that left needle. I love about the, this machine the fact that it has decent sized screws in there. I'm sure you've noticed my arthritic fingers. Um, for me the fact that the screws are a decent size makes life much easier. So right needle, um, close the tubes which I've already done. Now I'm going to use for this a woolly nylon. This is a lovely decorative thread. The beauty of a woolly nylon is the fact that as you stretch it, it slides beautifully through the machine. But the minute you take the tension off, all those fibres open up, which makes it ideal for fabrics that fray easily, so you get lots of pokey bits in your stitching. This will help to cover all of those, and as you see, I've selected a variegated thread just to give it a little bit extra oomph. Now, the problem with threading woolly nylon um, through... Come out a bit for you threading woolly nylon through um, jetter threading oops, don't do it with the foot down Jan <clears throat> is the fact that because this woolly nylon is so fibrous the jet air will just whoosh straight through it and won't take it through so in order to thread we need to make a thread cradle so we take a long length of ordinary thread doubled and then I put both cut ends down the tube like so hold the loop and wash it through now you see it's come out this side incidentally girls and boys sorry don't mean to be sexist this is how you keep those tubes clean you floss them so you get yourself, this isn't particularly brilliant because this is um, an overlock thread, so it's not that good for flossing, um, but a nice heavily twisted thread, polyester, um, because then what happens is the synthetic fibre uh, starts up static electricity within the tube when you're doing this, 
and then those um, the, the twist in the fibre will pull out any lint that is in those tubes. So it's always a good idea if you have a jet air machine just to floss it every so often just to keep those tubes clean. Now you see I'm just dropping the woolly nylon into that loop. By doing it this way I'm avoiding pulling a knot through because if that knot breaks down there where the two, jo uh, two tubes have joined, if that knot breaks right there you're going to have to have a you're going to have a real problem trying to poke it out. So just pull the other end and there it is. Okay. This is the only stitch that I will actually take that thread and put it under the foot. With my baby lock, with all other stitches, as you've seen, I just leave the thread hanging over the top of the foot. But I do find that when I'm using the subsidiary looper and just two threads, I find it more inclined to pick the stitches up if I've got the threads under the foot. So this is my needle thread and what I'm going to do with this one, just thread that. <laughs> Try the other one, that's better. And trim it. Same with the woolly nylon. I don't need all that thread hanging underneath. What I need to do now, first off let's make sure the tubes are open. We are going to loosen the tension on that needle thread right down to zero. The reason being I've got the upper loop, the lower looper thread will appear on top, the needle thread will appear underneath. When I open them out, I want the balance to be the same top and bottom. If you can't get it loose enough with your needle thread channel, there's no reason why you shouldn't move it over to the upper looper thread. Because if you think about it, we have default settings on these. On this machine, it's four. You can see the four is quite clearly marked. That is your default setting. However, the tension on the needle threads is not the same as the tension on the looper threads, purely because the looper threads have to make a figure of eight shape. Therefore, they are going quite fast. They make quite a, they need quite a long length of thread but the needle threads are the ones that hold those two layers together. So by default, although they're all set to four, these will be actually a bit tighter than those. If you fail to get a good stitch with your needle tension set at zero, move this thread over to the upper looper channel and that will give you a bit more looseness, if there is such a word. Um, I'm now going to set my stitch width to oh, about 6.5. I think that should give us a good stitch. When you start out with an extra thick thread, always, until you're sure, start with a long length of thread. Because otherwise, as I've just said to you, those looper threads make a figure of eight shape. If you've got the stitch length too short, you'll find that all, all those stitches get crowded together badly. So we're going to start, because I know this machine uh, and the thread, I'm going to take it to stitch length two. And then what we do is we take our two pieces of fabric, wrong sides together. You work completely the opposite way around with this, with, uh, this stitch. So wrong sides together. Um, stitch length here. We'll try. We'll try two, I think. And this is one of those times when you want the thread hanging off the edge. So I'm just 
twiddling with the tensions until I can see the threads meeting at the edge of the fabric. Looks a bit loose and loopy, doesn't it? It is supposed to look loose and loopy because by the time I get hold of both sides of that fabric and pull there is my flat look. It works beautifully with stretch fabrics. You get a ladder effect on the opposite side if you wish, you can use this side as the right side, make your stitches longer, and you can weave narrow ribbon or wool in and out of those ladder stitches. And on that side, you can put all kinds of decorative threads through your lower looper. I have done patchwork for my quilting like this. Obviously on an overlocker you're not going to be able to do all the, the fancy Dresden shapes and that sort of thing but a simple log cabin or just using up all your scraps of fabric looks lovely if it's stitched together with a flat lock like that. The other thing I will I can often do with this machine if you don't have a cover stitch machine and you want to hem the t-shirt that you've just made then you can use that two thread flat lock to do a blind hem on your overlocker and that is by far the best way to hem your stretchy fabrics and I will show you that shortly. If you don't have a cover stitch machine and you want to do a hem on your overlocker with a lot of stretch to it. Um, I find it much easier if you've got the blind hem foot. This is the blind hem foot. Once again, it's marked very helpfully with an H. It has a screw there, which if you loosen it, you can slide this guide left or right. So you can line it up perfectly um, I'll find something to poke with. There we are. So there is my needle position. So I want where this fold goes in the fabric, I want that needle just to go into the edge of the fold. I have already tested it, so I've got it already set up. But you need to do a couple of test pieces with your chosen fabric just to make sure that you've got it all set up nicely. There we are. Um, threads under the foot. As I said, with a two thread, I always put the threads under the foot to make sure that it's sitting nicely. Now your blind hem, you fold up in the normal way. So what I usually do is to fold it up and clip it so that I make absolutely certain that I've got that hemline in the right place. Then you fold it back on yourself so that you have a little edge sticking out and that fold is where the needle line needs to go. So once I've done that, I then put a clip in that side, turn it over and remove these and that is where I tend to stitch. Um, stretch fabrics I will clip, woven fabrics I will press. That will give you a much more accurate uh, line than if you just wing it. Um, so here's one I prepared earlier. Now because I'm working in a straight line you will probably mostly be doing um, working in a circle but obviously because of this test piece I'm working on a straight line so I've put a pin at each end 
because as it goes into the foot sometimes you find it twists slightly. So I can now take that clip off and I'm going to slide the fold into the fold of the fabric. Let's give you a better look. So there is the fold of the fabric sliding through that guide but the excess is underneath and that's going to be trimmed and overstitched. Slide it in until you're almost at the blade that way the feed dogs will successfully take it in and then just put the foot down. Now stitch length four obviously you want to make these stitches as invisible as possible um, so you make the stitch as long as you possibly can. I've still got the same tension settings from the, the last flat lock I did so I've still got my needle thread uh, tension on zero and I've got my looper thread tension on three and I am using just the right needle. So with the foot down and you see I put the um, the pin just to the outside of the foot so it's not going to interfere and I am now looking over the back to make sure that I've got it correctly lined up a little bit of concentration while you're stitching. I always like to watch what's going on by the needle as well as what's going on this end so I'm inclined to stitch quite slowly when I'm doing this. And here as you see this is where it's inclined with a straight piece to just slip so you'll have to forgive me for that normally I'm doing my stitching in the round so if that's missed and it has so remove the pins fold it to the right side so there you have your invisible hem just pull it flat and that's what it looks like on the wrong side it goes nice and flat so even on a baby's garment uh, that is going to be fairly soft you could always put woolly nylon into that lower looper and that will make that hem even softer but as you see on the correct side you've got little tiny lines but it's not really any more intrusive than perhaps a, um, a two needle cover stitch but the beauty of that and the advantage over your twin needle stitching is that because that will still stretch extremely well and means that your t-shirt hems when you try to get them on are not going to pull tight and tear uh, because there's no stretch in the stitch.